Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Dementia Friends Program. I'm Amin from Coquitlam Public Library, and we are very lucky that we have Janine from the Alzheimer's Society with us today. Hi, Janine. Hi, Amin. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, firstly, I do want to thank each person for attending the, this evening's session. Uh, just to let you know that this session is intended to be uh, a Dementia 101. And so what that is, it's a high level overview of what dementia is and what can each of us do to help make our communities more dementia friendly. So, and on that note, I also want to extend a big thank you to Coquitlam Library for inviting us during Alzheimer Awareness Month to do this presentation. And this is exactly how we start making communities dementia friendly. So um, just to make note, some of the information we talk about may cause an emotional response, like already from um, the information in the chat box, I see that a lot of you have personal connection uh, to dementia. Um, most of you seem to be caregivers in some capacity. Uh, so you or you yourself may be living uh, with dementia. So you know, we, this may generate some emotional um, uh, responses, uh, or you may have some questions that really need to, we need to dive into a little bit deeper, and we also need more time for. So if you find you do need to talk uh, more about something you've heard here tonight, or some other question that you have regarding uh, the dementia journey, I strongly want to encourage you to connect with the first link dementia helpline. I'm going to give you their number now, but if you don't get it, don't panic. We'll have it on the last slide. Um, it is 1-800-936-6033. That's the dementia helpline, but I am, like I said, will be on our last slide. I just want to check at this point with Amin if the volume, my volume is good. It's perfect. Okay, great. Okay, so... All right, so uh, before we dive in, um, I'll just quickly introduce myself again. I know Min has said who I am. Yes, my name is Janine Willemson, and I'm a support and education coordinator with the First Link program of the Alzheimer's Society. And again, it's abs my absolute pleasure and privilege to be with you this evening. Um, for those that joined after I made this request, just like I'm introducing myself, um, if you haven't yet put in the chat box, uh, who you are, and again, no pressure, just if you'd like to do that, and where you're joining us from, uh, so whereabouts in the Lower Mainland or in BC, and, um, you know, why did you choose to, to join us tonight? What was your reason for signing up? And again, you can use the chat box for that. So I'm going to go ahead now and turn my camera off uh, just so that you can focus on the PowerPoint and also that I don't have anything competing with my Wi-Fi connection that has happened before and hasn't gone well. So let me turn that there off. Go. There we go. Good. All right, so uh, what will we learn together tonight? So in tonight's presentation, we are going to look at what a dementia friendly community and a dementia friend is. Uh, we're going to look at how to recognize that someone might be living with dementia and some communication strategies to help us. And then finally, we're going to uh, look at where you can go for more help. And already you would know that one of those places is the dementia helpline. And then just so you know, at various points during the presentation, I'm going to give you an opportunity to participate by using the chat box. Okay, so apparently uh, we all love our stats and experts tell us that during a presentation, um, interesting stats will stay with the audience long after the presentation finishes. So yeah, are a couple of stats for you. Although I do hope you'll remember more than just these stats. So there are an estimated 70,000 people living with dementia in BC. What might be surprising to some of us is that of those 70,000, approximately 60% live in the community. So bearing those stats in mind, do you see the real need for building dementia-friendly communities and why 
um, that's one of the Alzheimer's Society of BC's initiatives. So I'm going to start right here with getting you to use the chat box. Um, what do you think might make a commu community dementia friendly? So if you have some ideas that you are right ready to share right now, please go ahead and type in the chat box. However, I am going to ask you this question again after we have gone through a little more of our presentation and watched a video. So don't feel there's no pressure, but if you would like to put something in, please go ahead and do that. And while you are doing that, um, I am just going to move on and talk about um, some of the characteristics of a dementia friendly community. And then I'm at the end of this slide, I'm gonna ask them if there's anything we can read in the chat box. So it's a community uh, that's focusing on stigma reduction. Uh, that's a big part. So where people living with dementia will feel supported by individuals, businesses and local governments and are able to participate in their communities to the fullest extent possible. So some communities in BC have already been hard at work at achieving this and um, a good, good example of this, and I think we actually have a representative from them on the presentation tonight joining us, is the Dementia Friendly Task Group in Maple Ridge. Um, they've done an amazing job and what they've done, some of the things they've done over the last couple of years of they've offered Dementia Friends education for city management teams. They've hosted walks to raise funds and awareness added dementia support information to their seniors resource directory, and they've also worked quite closely with their division of family practice to improve health care for older adults. So in order for this initiative to be successful, it starts with people just like you and me who choose to become a dementia friend, and that's someone who is understanding and inclusive of people living with dementia. Um, that someone that is prepared to become educated about dementia and knows that a person living with dementia may sometimes experience the world differently. And that's a, a, it's a really important point that. Um, Amin, I'm just going to stop for a moment and see if there's anything that's come into the chat box. Um, right now, there is a uh, comment. It says, Inc by Marika, increased understanding that some people with dementia are clear-minded in many ways, even if they can't remember things in the near present as well others. Yeah, great point. That and a video I'm going to be showing shortly will emphasize that one for sure. Thank you for sharing that. And then we have another um, comment. Oh, this is just about, um, there's a person joining from Burnaby um, whose grandma has dementia. And regarding your question, uh, she feels that to improve the public awareness of what dementia is could be important and we should work together to bring some support to people who either directly or indirectly affected by dementia. Yeah, good point about directly and indirectly, because I'm sure for those caregivers that are with us tonight, you know how much that is impacting you. So thank you. Yeah, and then also another comment is including uh, persons living with dementia in initiatives. Great, thank you. Okay, and yeah, if there's anything else as we're um, you, going through the presentation uh, that you wanna put in the, in the comments, please go ahead and do so. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is actually show you a video. It's called Jim's Story. Uh, it's about seven minutes, but believe me, it's well worth every minute. So I'm hoping it will work. And as a backup, Amin's got this on her um, laptop there in case mine doesn't work. So just a little bit about Jim. Jim Mann is a former board member with the Alzheimer's Society of BC and the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. And he's also a person living with dementia. Jim is a passionate advocate for people living with dementia. And this video is about his experience living with dementia and what a dementia friendly community means for him. So here we go. Uh, if you're having problems hearing the video or seeing the video, please just put a comment in the box.
has it stopped? Yes, the video stopped. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> More than 70,000 people in BC are currently living with Alzheimer's disease or another type of dementia. People with dementia are in our communities, working, living, and participating in activities, enjoying their neighborhoods. A part of creating a healthy city for all is creating a place where people feel safe, included, and a sense of belonging. This disease does not just affect older adults. People can develop dementia in their early 60s, 50s, and even 40s. Jim is one of those people, and here is his experience. My journey started eight years ago at the age of 58 when I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. It's a strange disease to fully grasp. People look fine on the outside, but the problem, the degeneration of the brain, is inside. It's also a disease that has a stereotype built around it. In fact, there is no stereotypical person living with Alzheimer's disease or other dementia. Everyone has a different journey and will maintain different strengths, abilities, and capacities along the disease trajectory. I want to share my personal experiences with dementia because I hope that they might cause some aha moments or provide a sense of confidence for someone experiencing many of the same things. I hope too it might show that there is life after a diagnosis of dementia. For me, it is so important to educate. I talk about my journey with Alzheimer's to challenge the stereotypes. I believe that through awareness and compassion, we can become a more inclusive community. Recently, I went to buy a newspaper and pulled out change from my pocket. I looked at the coins and look some more, but couldn't identify the coins to use to pay for it. Out of frustration, I put all the change on the newspaper. The cashier picked up the amount she wanted, and we moved forward. One small example of patience and empathy. Some time ago, when I was at home, I had to call emergency services. In my rush and confusion to dial 911, I realized I should have used our portable phone. I hung up, which I should not have done. I ended up with all these people in our house and the RCMP knocking on the door to investigate why I had called 911 and hung up. A firefighter was asking me questions. So was a paramedic and a police officer. People were milling about and they all seemed to be talking. I gather I handled the situation well enough, but if that were happened today, I wonder, if I were unable to respond adequately, how would the officials deal with me? Would they understand? Would they show me patience? Or would they see a healthy man and discount any thought of a possible dementia? Would they take a more aggressive approach? For 25 years, I worked for CP Air and Canadian Airlines, and during my career, I traveled frequently for business. One particular time at an airport that I knew well, I went up the escalator and then down again. Two different times. I turned right and then left on the main floor until I told myself to get a grip. I finally asked for help to find my flight. I was astounded at my inability to take charge. Now, eight years into living with Alzheimer's, I've come to realize that I have good days and bad days. I suppose the same can be said for all of us, except when I have a good day, it means I get to exercise my independence. And when I have a bad day, when my mind is too muddled to do much on my own, it means I need support. For a person who loved, and thrived in business. I am now limited in my daily activities to doing one real task a day. Is that frustrating? You bet it is. But my life isn't over. I do have a purpose. Like doing this video to tell you that we all have a role in creating inclusive, dementia-friendly communities so that people like me and the guys in my support group can keep on living as well as possible. People with dementia need to get out. We need to socialize and get exercise. Sometimes to do this, we need a little push 
and extra support from our friends and families, but also from our communities, from the cashier at the grocery store or the bus driver to the staff at the local community center or from the folks just out walking on the street. The first step to doing that is dismissing the stereotypes we hold about people with dementia. Like the time at a hospital emergency room when I insisted my wife Alice accompany me to the examining room because I have Alzheimer's disease. A senior nurse in the ER told me I didn't need her with me because I looked fine. And that's part of the problem, isn't it? How is someone with Alzheimer's disease supposed to look? You can't see the degeneration of someone's brain from the outside. Despite her education and experience, the nurse had displayed a familiar stereotype about Alzheimer's. She'd assumed that as soon as a person is diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, they immediately become incapable and incompetent. It's probably obvious to say, but looks can be deceiving. And that is the challenge, which is why I wear this lanyard. For me, it's an education tool. I am showing a willingness to talk to anyone about Alzheimer's. I make the most of teachable moments to help break the stereotype of a person with Alzheimer's disease. We all have a role in creating more inclusive, dementia-friendly communities. For more information and resources, or to learn more about the Society's Dementia-Friendly Communities Initiative, please call Okay, um, everybody can hear me again? Yes. Oh, good, good. So, um, so just so you know, what you'll be noticing for the rest of the presentation is that I'm going to keep referring back to this video, to Jim's video, um, you know, making use of the examples from that um, and uh, messages to drive home certain points. So what is uh, a dementia friend anyway? Here are some of the qualities of a, a dementia friend. They are respectful towards people living with dementia. They're making a person living with dementia feel accepted. And they do that by focusing on the person's strengths and abilities instead of their losses. And they offer assistance when needed rather than doing nothing. Um, and I know that's a little bit of a tough one because there's the fine line between well, when do we let people try to do things for themselves? And then when do we offer assistance? But when it comes to um, dementia-friendly communities, um, we'll talk more about that and how you can offer assistance. So a good example uh, of this would be what we saw in Jim's video and how the corner store clerk patiently assisted him with uh, counting out the correct money when he was trying to purchase the newspaper. Okay, so an important criteria of becoming a dementia friend is to understand what dementia is. So what exactly is it? I want you to take a guess and feel free to write in the chat box if you would like as to what the number one question we at the Alzheimer's Society get. What do you think that number one question is? So I mean, if you see anybody typing away and there is anything there, let me know. I will let you know when we have a comment. Okay. I won't leave too much time for this, but um, anything there? On the I have line? a question. Um, what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Oh, you got it right. Who was that? <laughs> Um, we have two of them, Teresa and Christine. Okay, perfect. Yes, that is the top question. The question we get is, what is the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia? And so let's take a closer look at that, because that is a very important one for sure. Okay. So there are many types of dementia. Um, think of dementia as an umbrella term for uh, any disease that causes physical changes in the brain, with Alzheimer's disease being one of the types of dementia. Another more simple way to put it is think of the word dog 
you can have many different types of dogs, um, Dalmatians, golden retrievers. Uh, but similarly, it's the same with many different types of dementias or diseases that cause dementia. So you have Alzheimer's disease, vascular dementia, Lewy body dementia, and others. And um, I know in the chat box, when you were introducing yourself, some mentioned some of these uh, diseases that the person they're caring for has. Um, dementia, the important part to remember here is dementia causes physical changes to the brain. And this, uh, these can cause changes in behavior, personality, and judgment. Different dementias cause different changes um, in the brain and they affect each person differently. So that's very important to remember. And Jim Mann spoke about that in his video, the uniqueness. And so we like to say, if you know one person with dementia, you know one person with dementia. Dementia is not part of normal aging. It's uh, Dementia is different than what people experience with normal age-related memory loss. So even though age is the biggest risk factor for developing dementia, and what we mean by this is if let's say we all live to be about 90 years old, approximately half of us would develop some kind of dementia. However, also remember though that some people live to be older than that, um, or living to their 90s and don't ever develop dementia. So as we age, just normal aging, we all experience some changes to our memories. So things like forgetting our keys once in a while or forgetting where we parked the car, um, or maybe not recalling the name of a colleague we worked with quite some time ago. These are likely signs of normal age related memory loss. However, the difference when it comes to dementia is they, people are experiencing constantly misplacing their keys, forgetting that they drove to the store and actually walking home, that has happened to people, and then forgetting the names of people who are important to us or we see often. This might be a sign that someone, uh, something more is going on. So if you are noticing these things uh, that aren't normal for you, it is important to see your doctor. Then unfortunately, dementia is progressive and non-reversible. And that means in time, it does get worse and it is also unfortunately terminal. Now, there are some medications that can help to manage the symptoms, uh, but they don't work forever. And uh, they also don't work for everybody. And at this point in time, although there's a lot of amazing research and lots of good things happening, there's still no cure for dementia. So I like this um, diagram as it is more of a sequential way of demonstrating how the various diseases are related to the term dementia. So this slide um, tells a story in a more linear form. If you look at the left hand side there, you'll see the progressive degenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease and vascular mixed dementia, Lewy body and, and such. And so these diseases cause destructive protein and vascular changes in and around brain cells and neural pathways. And this damage is what we term um, dementia. So the symptoms that are caused are because of the damage. And so some of them we've already discussed and you will be familiar, familiar with. Uh, the memory loss, confusion, impaired judgment, behavior changes, and others. And then I just want to show you uh, the slide of uh, the brain. So one of the key things that many people do not realize, we've mentioned it before, Jim Mann mentioned it in the video, um, is that how this disease um, damages the physical uh, structure of the brain. Different dementias cause different changes in the brain. So for example, um, in this slide you are, uh, that you're looking at, we are comparing a healthy brain on the left-hand side and the brain of a similar sized and aged person with advanced Alzheimer's disease on the right. So because these changes are happening inside a person's head, we cannot see them happening. Alzheimer's disease causes significant shrinkage of the brain. 
And those physiological changes can cause many of the symptoms which we discussed in the previous couple of slides, the memory loss and confusion and in communication problems, et cetera. Uh, many uh, dementias actually make it impossible for the brain to retain new information. You can imagine how frustrating that is for somebody that's living with dementia and how frustrating that is, especially in the beginning when people are not quite sure what's going on, but for the caregivers. And yeah, again, when we look at this, uh, it's just a, it's a sort of a bit of a wake-up call. It's a good example that we cannot expect the right side of the brain to function the same as the left side. And yet, because other, often people living with dementia look fine, um, as was said to Jaman by the, the nurse in the ER, they may experience that exact thing, that people around them do not take their physical brain changes into account. So hence again, the importance of people educating themselves about dementia. Once we start to get some basic understanding of dementia and the impact it has on the brain, we realize that it's not possible for the person living with dementia to control these changes. And therefore we, with the healthy brains, are the ones who need to adapt to meet the needs of the person living with dementia. Okay, so what might not be true about dementia? Uh, so let's, we're moving on to the part where we're going to talk about myths surrounding dementia. And uh, this is an opportunity for you again to use the chat box if you would like. Um, what do you think might not be true about dementia? So take a few minutes, let me know um, things that maybe that you've heard and you've gone, oh, I don't think that's true. Or possibly you're unsure if it's true or not. And while you're thinking of um, some things that uh, have crossed your mind or you've wondered about, I'll give you an example. And maybe this will trigger some other thoughts and ideas for you. Uh, so a few years ago, quite a few years, I believe, there, were, there was a lot of interest in dangers of aluminum. So especially of cooking with aluminum pots. Some of you may remember that. Uh, did you hear that and wonder if that was true? Um, yeah, so use the chat box and, and I mean, if there are any comments, you could let me know. Right now there isn't, but I will. Perfect, I'll keep going and. Okay, so let's talk about what dementia is not. So it is not um, strictly a genetic disorder. There are two kinds of Alzheimer's disease. There's familial and sporadic. So sporadic means that it can happen to anyone and accounts for 95% of Alzheimer's disease. The other 5% of Alzheimer's disease is familial, which means that there is that strong genetic link. Um, there isn't just, um, this isn't just a disease that affects older people. So there's often that misconception. And you can see again with the Jaman video, uh, there are thousands of people in BC who have dementia that are under the age of 65. And you often hear us refer to that as young onset. Again, we spoke about this earlier. It's not part of normal aging or memory loss. Unfortunately, it's not preventable. However, the important thing here is that we use the term risk reduction. And so examples of risk reduction strategies do include things that you're probably very aware of, exercise, getting enough sleep, learning a new language, even playing word games, uh, importance of a proper nutritious diet, and a very important one, which which I know is challenging during these COVID times uh, is maintaining an active social life. Unfortunately, at this point, dementia is not curable. Uh, there are some medications that will work for some people. It's, so it's very important to speak to the doctor about that. Uh, just because it's not curable doesn't mean that people can't have medication that may just enhance their quality of life. Um, again, the, because of the progression of the disease, those medications usually um, sort of have a, a shelf life, for lack of a better word. Um, and then for some people, depending on if there's other health conditions, they may not be able to take those um, medications. 
And at this time, research does not support the hypothesis that aluminum causes Alzheimer's disease or other dementias. I mean, was there any comments that you wanted me to address? There was no comments right now. Okay, perfect. And everyone's good still with sound? If yes. you're having problems, please let I Amin mean, know. Okay, so moving on uh, about myths, let's look at what dementia does not mean. And the first and most important one, it does not mean the end of a meaningful life. Um, so, you know, let's take example of uh, some of the important things in certain people's lives. Somebody like uh, who is a passionate gardener, all his life he's been a passionate gardener. Early in the disease, this person is still able to continue gardening on his own. But as the disease progresses, he now knows he requires more assistance, support, uh, and that can be from the main care partner, uh, it can be from a neighbor, it can be from family, and then again, it can be from the community. And uh, maybe there's community gardens that are set up where there's volunteers come and assist people that uh, would like to continue to be able to garden. So here again, this is uh, being able to allow this person for as long as possible to continue to do things that are important to them. It certainly does not mean that the person can not understand what is going on around them. And I believe somebody right in the beginning um, when they were introducing themselves sort of touched on this um, and the importance of this. So uh, absolutely. One I really wanna highlight is dementia does not mean that a person will become violent or aggressive. Changes to the brain may make it challenging for the person living with dementia to respond appropriately. And at times, this could feel or come across like aggressive behavior. It's important to remember that this behavior is often the result of the person living with dementia either having a different reality or the frustration that they feel when they're trying to uh, perform familiar tasks that they've always been able to do and it's becoming more and more difficult or they're finding it hard to find the right word. So struggling with communication very frustrating. And then referring to uh, behavior, I've jumped one slide ahead here, but I'll just finish this point. Uh, referring to behavior resulting from frustrations as reactive or responsive instead of aggressive just reflects understanding and compassion of the reality of the person living with dementia. Language really does matter, the words we choose to use. All right, so how might you know someone is living with dementia? This, that could be someone at your workplace, a family member, a friend, or people you're coming to contact with uh, in your community. So on this slide and in the next uh, couple of slides, we'll, we'll talk about the common signs of dementia. It is important to realize that this is not a diagnostic list. And that is experiencing these things do, does not mean that someone definitely has dementia, but rather that it is suggestive of someone having problems with their brain. And you may want to encourage the person to talk to their doctor. Problems with memory. So again, we've already covered this, but just to um, recap, it's normal to occasionally forget appointments, neighbors' names, um, friends' phone numbers, but then what, what happens? Usually we remember them again later. A person living with dementia may forget those things more often and unfortunately not remember them later, especially things that have happened more recently. Busy uh, people can be distracted. All of us uh, know what that's like. Uh, most of us are very busy, our plates are full. Uh, and so that from time to time means that possibly a good example would be pre-COVID, you had Thanksgiving and everybody came over, extended family. You made this amazing meal, all sat down, ate the meal. You finished, you got up, walked into the kitchen and there on the stove were the carrots that you had prepared, you cooked and you forgot to put out. Um, and that was because you were so busy. Now a person with dementia 
they may have trouble with tasks that they have been familiar with their whole lives. So somebody that's always been an amazing cook is having problems uh, preparing a meal or following a recipe uh, when they're baking. Uh, and sometimes they may look at carrots on the counter in front of them and not even remember how to cook them in that moment. Problems with language um, is often uh, an indicator uh, right in the beginning, one of the symptoms we see in a lot of the different diseases um, causing dementia. So having, we all know what it's like and how frustrating it is to find the right word sometimes. Unfortunately, people living with dementia may forget simple words or what they can also do is substitute words. And so they are, then what ends up happening, it makes the person that's listening to them, uh, it makes it difficult for the person to understand what the person's trying to say. Often problems with abstract thinking. Uh, challenging uh, as challenges following conversation. So from time to time, we all get distracted and we lose our place, but people with dementia may be a step behind in the conversation. And then poor judgment. Um, unfortunately, a person with dementia, uh, area of the brain, especially the frontal part of the brain, if, if that's been impacted, uh, you will see possibly decreased judgment. And so one example would be wearing heavy clothes on a hot day. Um, or they may find it difficult to determine what to keep and what to throw out uh, in their space, um, uh, resulting in a lot of clutter. And then disorientation uh, of time and place. A person with dementia can become lost in familiar places. Even uh, their building or complex uh, if they've lived there for many, many years. We want to touch on wandering. Um, the term wandering refers to a variety of behaviors that may result in a person living with dementia becoming lost. Uh, the term though, it's a bit of a misnomer because in fact, the person may appear quite purposeful. They may well be going somewhere specific, but that place may not exist anymore or may not be safely in walking distance. So wandering is actually quite a common behavior associated with dementia, and it's a direct result, again, of the physical changes in the brain. Um, an estimated 60% of people living with dementia are likely to wander at some point. Wandering behavior may occur for a number of reasons. Uh, figuring out why a person living with dementia wanders can really be difficult, uh, a lot of stress and frustration for the families. But some common reasons include the person may be agitated due to medication side effects, too much noise or other stimulation. Uh, the person may believe they need to leave the house in order to go to work. Uh, that's, you know, they've been doing that for the last 40 years. And so now they feel that this is what they, they need to do. So they have a purpose, they're going to work or they need to pick up their kids from school. Um, so there is a purpose behind where they're going. Another one that happens unfortunately is they do not recognize their own home and may wanna go somewhere that to them feels more familiar. It's important to know though, when someone living with dementia goes missing, it is an emergency. Um, and it's important that we do call 911 uh, immediately and do not delay uh, doing that. Um, you know, wandering like walking is not a harmful behavior, but when you add short-term memory loss and impaired ability to reason or to make sound judgments, this absolutely can contribute um, to an unsafe um, wandering experience. We also recommend looking uh, for a medical alert safely home bracelet or other form of identification uh, to just as a, as a way to make sure that if a person does go missing, they have some way of um, locating them. And you can look on our website for more information on that. So how can you help? Um, what can you do? You may interact with someone living with dementia for many reasons, and everyone has a role to play in contributing to a dementia-friendly community. Ensuring that you and those around you know how to recognize dementia 
nature and communicate appropriately is key to creating a society uh, that is supportive and inclusive of people living with dementia. So we're going to talk briefly about some communication tips. We have eight that we're going to review. All right, so firstly, getting the person's attention. So if you are approaching an individual who is upset or emotional, it can help to establish a calm, caring atmosphere because your calmness, and maybe some of you have already experienced this, may help to settle the person. When getting that person's attention, it's important to approach them from the front so that you don't invade their personal space or startle them. Unfortunately, almost earlier in the um, the dementia, changes in the brain that happen actually impact peripheral vision. And so they have less ability to see what's happening around them. And as you approach the person, uh, state your name and ask if they would like your help. So for example, I could say, hello, my name is Janine. I was just coming to visit my mom. Would you like some help uh, or are you lost? Establishing and maintaining eye contact contact and really be mindful of your body language. Uh, if you need the person to do something, try demonstrate it by using nonverbal communication. So like cueing. Uh, so for example, you notice that the person seems uneasy, um, you're worried about their stability uh, on their feet and there's a bench right there. You could point to the bench and you could say, oh, let's go sit on the bench and do that together. So cueing, doing things together, um, that's just often the best way that their brain will be able to follow instructions in that moment, especially when they are feeling stressed. Bringing a person to a quiet place, we spoke about this before, um, person with dementia, the brain really has difficulty filtering out noises, uh, such as traffic, too much talking around them, and can actually cause the anxiety levels to go up. Speaking slowly and clearly, it's important to speak slowly, but not to use elder speak. And what we mean by that is using words such as sweetie or dear. Um, again, somebody in the chat box in the beginning just spoke about the importance of just because you have dementia doesn't mean that you are, uh, your intelligence goes down, right? So very important. Um, or another thing that we just automatically assume is that the person has a hearing problem. So speaking clearly does not mean speaking louder. Uh, for me, I will be honest, personally, this is one I've had to work on. It seems naturally as I slow down my talking speed, somehow I increase the volume and that's not a good thing. If you do suspect the person may have hearing problems, a good um, strategy is actually lowering your pitch. And that usually has better results than increasing the volume. And then sharing one message at a time. You want to present one idea at a time. Um, you may have to allow the person time to absorb one sentence. Important part is remembering to be patient, bearing in mind that they may not have the same ability to be rational and logical. And the best thing you can do for them is to remain calm and monitor the tone of your voice. Close-ended questions are so important important, things where you can get a yes or no answer. Um, for example, you, you know, you're going to visit your mom and you see somebody that seems lost, they're standing out in the street and uh, on the sidewalk. And instead of saying, um, you know, can I help you? Where do you live? You could say, do you know this building? So they, if they are able to answer, it's much easier and they can say yes or no. Again, we spoke about this before, allowing time for response, and then repeat or try again later. Uh, sometimes that, that is what we need to do. Um, if you're concerned about the person's safety, obviously you're gonna stay with them. But if you notice that questioning the person is just causing their anxiety to increase, just be with them, just being there, um, watching your body language, and try again later. Um, to ask those questions to see if you can get a response. 
And then the final two are, in my opinion, the best strategies you can use to reduce anxiety and stress levels in the person living with dementia. And this is actually something that will be relevant for people uh, when you come across a possible person in the community that has dementia and is maybe um, experiencing distress, or for many of you that are care partners for someone living with dementia. The, these two are great strategies, will help everybody. So respond to feelings, not stories. I'm sure you all are nodding about that one. And the next one, connect don't correct. So listen actively and carefully to what the person is trying to say. You want to respond to the emotional tone of the statement. Uh, you may not even understand all the words being said, but you may recognize an emotion. And that's what we're looking for. And, you know, emotions such as fear or anger. Uh, an example, say, if the person feels that you forgot to contact them about a repair in the unit. Uh, maybe you're the property manager um, and all of a sudden the repairman arrives at their door and they know nothing about this and they're really upset and they phone you up. Um, it's better to apologize to them and acknowledge that they feel frustrated because that's their reality than to try to convince them that you actually sent them a notice. You sent them an email, you put a notice in their mailbox two weeks ago. Um, so you may say, have to say something like, I can see how frustrated you are. Let's get this sorted out as soon as we can. Also, do not rely strictly on the person's verbal responses for information. Uh, the person may not be able to express themselves fully with words, uh, but their actions may tell you more about their needs. So at this point, I know we are getting closer to the end of our time, but I'm almost at the end of the presentation. I thought this would be another good chat box opportunity uh, to see if any of you have used any of these strategies um, or possibly have some others that you'd like to suggest or recommend. Please feel free and put those in the chat box for us. And then I'll ask you to monitor that. I will let you know when we have a comment. So I'll just keep going and um, we're almost we're almost at the end and then we'll open it up to uh, looking if there's anything in the chat box and any other questions that people may have. All right, so if you are interested in learning more about what you can do to support people living with dementia in your workplace, we also have a Making Your Workplace Dementia Friendly series of guides, and they're catered towards various professional sectors. Uh, and you'll find more information about this on our website. And you, you'll see on the slide in front of you the various different uh, workplaces. Also want to share with you some of the support, education and information the Alzheimer's Society provides to help people with dementia and their caregivers to live well on their dementia journey. So we have resources center, uh, centers across the province that offer education programs, as well as support groups, one-on-one -on -one support, Minds in Motion and other information. While we have currently suspended the society's in-person activities until it's safe to gather in person again, we are offering adapted online and telephone programs. And these include, uh, we are doing telephone caregiver support groups. Uh, they become extremely popular. We have many of them happening. And uh, people who thought it would be really difficult to go from in-person to telephone support groups have managed uh, really well and uh, look forward to those. Those are once a month. We have weekly webinars every Wednesday. They're live at two o'clock, all different topics, uh, but they do get recorded. And so you can look at the recorded ones on our website. And then in January, we started, which is, it is January, but beginning of January, we started the Minds Emotion online. So you can call the First Link Dementia Helpline for information about these programs or other information or support uh, around living with dementia. 
we uh, really appreciate you spreading the word and getting involved. We host a number of events uh, throughout the year where um, it's an opportunity for us to raise money and awareness. Um, and um, it's not just to support, or well, the majority of it, yes, to, for the families of those affected by the disease, it's also to, we contribute towards research uh, into the cause of and cure for the disease. And so if you're interested in any of these events, how you can volunteer, donate, or participate, uh, please do go to our website. And so as we conclude, um, I want to leave you with five things to share about dementia. And so they really are a summary of what we have discussed this evening. And feel free to jot these down and share them with others. So let's look at the first one. It's not a natural part of aging. Uh, it's certainly not just about losing your memory. And it is very possible to live well with dementia. And there is more to a person than a diagnosis of dementia. And finally, the Alzheimer's Society of BC is here to help you. And as I just finish up and thank you for your time today, uh, I'm going to finish with this first linked dementia helpline slide. And, and so uh, if you do have any questions about the information you've heard, um, we'll take a few minutes at the end, but if there's more in-depth um, questions and just more time that you need about uh, living with dementia or caring for somebody with dementia, please don't hesitate to call our first link dementia helpline. We have um, extended our hours. That started, I think it's almost a year ago go now where we're operating Monday to Friday between 9 a.m. and 8 p.m. and we also have services in Cantonese or Mandarin and Punjabi and so um, yeah thank you so much for your time and I mean I will hand it over to you but I am right here I'll put my video on and if anybody does have any questions um, that we can look at in the last few minutes we have one question where it says, um, are there any, uh, are any of the education programs run jointly by a speech pathologist? Uh, sorry, so are any of the educations run jointly with by a speech pathologist? Was that yeah. the question? Yeah. Okay, yeah, no, not our educations. We um, do not um, run them with a speech pathologist. However, I do know that they are, um, speech pathologists that do work with people living with dementia. And so what you could do there is phone the First Link Dementia Helpline and ask if there's uh, um, any contacts they can give you, any way they can give you some more information on that. Awesome. So you, there's always some resources that the First Link Dementia Yeah, we, you know, we always do our best. Um, because we're not for profit, we cannot uh, recommend um, certain companies, but we absolutely do our best to help our clients to navigate what they need um, to find the, the resources that they need. We do our very best. Okay, hopefully that will help. And another question is, can someone who is diagnosed with dementia have coarse uh, cough syndrome? Um, yes, absolutely. That is one of the diseases that cause dementia. So as we discussed in the beginning, there's a variety of different neurological progressive diseases, and that is one of them, unfortunately. And uh, we do have more, sorry, if for that person, if they do want more information, we have a resource, a handout um, on that specific disease. So uh, you could contact the First Link Dementia Helpline. Or if you are a client of ours, maybe some people on the call tonight already uh, in con con connection with us and receive our regular mailing. So just let somebody know. Okay. Um, and uh, another question we have is um, a participant's mother will be having surgery soon. And is there anything they, they could do um, from afar to support them? Yeah, good question. Um, so the, the mother has dementia. That's that's what what I'm, I'm, okay, yeah, yeah, I would really recommend calling the first link to mental helpline. Um, they're uh, off just off the top of my head now. 
Um, I, things that you could do, I'm not sure if there's somebody that is you're from a far distance like you're living away from the person yes i believe uh so i'm not sure if there's anybody that is close by another family member a friend um one of the things is definitely to make sure the hospital the the doctor who's doing the surgery is aware that the person has dementia um another thing is to maybe uh, try to send a getting to know me a little bit about me. We have those documents on our website um, just to let the staff know that are going to be caring for them. What some of the things that the person enjoys, some of the maybe names of people that are important to them. Anything that you think might be helpful to reduce anxiety if the person becomes disorientated and anxious before the surgery or after the surgery. Again, we've got a lot of different ideas that we can brainstorm with you. Mm -hmm. I think that will help. Uh, and another question we have is, is there any evidence that omega-3 supplements help with dementia? Um, I uh, don't have an answer for that in a sense, just because there are a lot of different supplements that people take that they th that work for them. So it seems to enhance their cognition. Um, and the same, you'll get somebody else who takes the same supplement and they see no difference. Mm -hmm. So, uh, um, you know, unfortunately, I think it's very much individual. Uh, but absolutely, supplements are not a bad thing to take. It's not it's not going to cure dementia, it's not going to cure it, but it may make the person just feel more, um, you know, just um, brighter. And they sometimes people just say some of the things that they do for themselves or for their care partners helps them just to feel not as foggy in the brain. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, another question is if you are unsure if someone has dementia, is there certain questions we can ask? to find out? Yes, yeah, so now that's a, that is um, a sensitive situation because um, you, first of all, who do you want to ask those questions to? Mm -hmm. So are you meaning asking the person or asking a professional? So uh, what I would recommend, the first thing to do is if you have concerns about somebody, uh, to contact us or to speak to their doctor if you can't speak to the doctor, you can contact us and you can share with us some of those um, symptoms, some things that you've noticed. And we can sort of give you an indication as to, hmm, you know, maybe this is something that you should get uh, the person, should speak to the person's doctor about. Or we could even give you some suggestions on how, how to broach the topic with the person. Mm -hmm. It's just to be very careful. Often people in the early stages, when they are experiencing um, uh, issues with their cognition, they are fully aware. Think about it for yourself. If you're starting to experience some problems, so a little bit of confusion, like I'm driving to the store, I've been doing this for the last 20 years, and I turn the corner, and all of a sudden, I just feel lost. Mm -hmm. What's going on? This is weird. And, it, and this is happening a few times, or uh, a name of somebody that you know you should know. And so people themselves usually are the ones to first recognize that. Now, depending on personalities, depending on various different reasons, um, some people will not respond well if a family member says, hey, you know, something's going on with you. Um, that may just be a way to put up a wall and that's not what you want. So it's very much, it's very important to really be sensitive about the way you approach that. Because at the end of the day, why is because you're doing it out of concern. And so you want to keep that as your main, the main reason. And the way you do it is always about the concern for that person. Mm -hmm. And our last question of the night is, um, can hearing or vision loss affect the progression of dementia? Yes, um, it, it can, unfortunately. Um, it, it's a difficult one because uh, sometimes it's not a hearing thing where a person can uh, improve by a hearing aid, getting a hearing aid. Mm -hmm. Often it's the uh, it's the processing in the brain that processes hearing and sight uh, that is being damaged by dementia. So what ends up happening is um, we it's very common for 
people to go and get their person's ears tested, the hearing tested by expensive hearing aids, uh, just to find out that it doesn't that hasn't improved anything. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other side of things, though, um, if you're just struggling with hearing loss and you're not dealing with that, unfortunately, apparently, that is one of the triggers that can lead to dementia. So it's important to 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 check that out. Thank you so much. And those are that's the last question of the night. Is that the last question? Well, I think we are about seven minutes over. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone, for joining us, and thank you, Janine for giving us all this great information. Yeah, you're very welcome. Please, again, um, I really appreciate everybody being here tonight, um, taking the time, and please reach out to us if uh, there's any way we can support you uh, in any way. And thank you so much, Amin, and to the Coquitlam Public Library for thank hosting us. We're very happy to host and uh, bring awareness. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.